Welcome to another episode of The Open Road. I'm Rich Bowen. And I'm Brian Proppett, welcoming you. Um, and we are kicking off another uh, series of episodes within our video cast. This one around the concept of open source citizenship. What it is, what does it mean, how does it work, um, all sorts of things. This is a really broad topic. Um, that we got into. And as we were talking to our guests, we quickly realized everybody has wildly different opinions about this. So I, I we hope that you'll get some insights like we did, because I, for one, learned a lot. How about you, Rich? I did. And, you know, over the last few years, we've, you know, we've been looking at projects and, and how some of them let people in because they want to, and other projects have requirements. They have criteria that you have to meet, and most projects are somewhere on this spectrum, and uh, we see that spectrum in these interviews. Yeah, so we we talked to three distinguished people, and, and we threw a lot of questions at them, and we're going to tackle these questions kind of one at a time. Um, and the first one was around what is, you know, citizenship? What does it mean to be a member or a citizen or whatever you want to call it of a given project? And as we talked this through, we did notice that um, we, we kind of had to bifurcate the question a little bit. And we talked about, like, what does it mean to be a member? And then, but then it also got in quickly into conversations about, how to become a member. Um, it wasn't always the same thing. And so our guests are gonna give a little bit of different uh, takes on this and even in different orders of, of, of things. But we'll start off with our first guest, Dave Neary, Senior Principal Software Engineer at Red Hat. And we posed the question to him, what does it mean to be a member of a project? That's uh, an interesting question. Well, I always like to refer to books that I've read and, and kind of the the thinking of other people. Um, so there's one passage from The Great Gatsby, the first chapter, which I, in anticipation of this, um, this call I brought with me, which I think kind of portrays the point very nicely. Um, so Nick Carraway, the main character in the book, has just arrived in West Egg. And uh, on his second day there, it was lonely for a day or so. Uh, on his second way there, this happens. It was lonely for a day or so until one morning, some man, more recently arrived than I, stopped me on the road. How do you get to West Egg Village? He asked helplessly. I told him, and as I walked on, I was lonely no, no longer. I was a guide, a pathfinder, an original settler. He had casually conferred on me the freedom of the neighborhood. And I think that idea that you belong in a place when you know it well enough to help somebody else is a really important idea. Uh, that's kind of, if you're looking for a boundary to belonging and a boundary to feeling part of a community, that's for me that, that the first time you help somebody else who's just marginally newer than you in the community is a really, really important moment. Do that's you, cool idea. yeah, it is. So by extension, would you say that the rights and responsibilities of a member are along those lines of, of providing um, assistance to other community members? And I mean, there's a gradient, right? You go from being an outsider to a member of a community to a leader in a community. And, and I think that that gradient, um, you know, you can become a member of a community with a pretty low bar to contribution or to, to you know, um, what you bring to the table uh, in terms of uh, helping the project or helping users of the project. But then to become a leader, uh, to be seen as, you know, a maintainer or somebody who has a position of seniority and influence in a community takes a lot more work. And I think I think that goes for physical communities as well as for virtual communities. Does that answer your question? And it did answer our question. I think so, yeah. 
That's a, it's kind of a cool way to look at it. Um, it. It's kind of on the end of the spectrum where you're a member of the community if you feel like you are. And to me, that reflects the most welcoming possible community, that, that people that step up and take ownership and start helping the newbies are now just as legitimately part of the, the membership as the people that have been around from the beginning. Yeah, exactly. And 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 shout out to Dave also too for classing up the joint by you know bringing in a literary quote, you know, because I just got a stack of comic books over here. But you know, <laughs> but I, I I thought it was uh, seriously uh, very germane to the conversation. Um, and and yeah, it's interesting. It's like th there's this idea of self determination here that you know when you feel like you belong you are a, a member of of the community um i i kind of like that it puts the onus back on uh, the individual participant um, so a couple comments about that one is that mm -hmm. um again digging into my apache heritage we have this notion of the duocracy the people that do are the people that run the show and, and this this is kind of in line with that view of the world if if you do the work then you're in but the the uh the dark side of this is that it can be intimidating to step forward and take ownership and so this has to be paired with a culture that that values and encourages people to take that ownership. Um, and, and you know, there's there's some projects that we've all been involved with where you don't feel comfortable with that. You you feel like the people that are there are the legitimate ones. And I'm a I'm a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's like I'm an invader. I'm a I'm an outsider. I'm an imposter. And and so it's it's a uh, it, it's this this uh, it's a give and take between the existing community members and those that are stepping in to participate. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm not sure the word you were looking for there. But yeah, interloper I, was the word interloper. I was looking for. Oh, okay. yeah. all right. Again, y'all are classing up the joint. Um, <laughs> OK, yeah, so. And, and, and Dave has gave a, a really succinct uh, way of uh, uh, putting it and examining the issue. Our, our next guest um, was, um, you know, really expounded on the project. And it was um, Greg Crawl Hartman, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a Linux kernel developer and maintainer on the Linux kernel project. And um, certainly someone who's well known um, in, the, uh, in the open source uh, ecosystem. And we, we kind of posed the question to him a little bit differently than we did to Dave. So the first thing we did was we asked him, how does one become um, a member of a community? And, and then later we asked him, you know, okay, well, what does it you know, mean? What does membership mean in the Linux Grove community? So we kind of did these back to back. Um, and here's what he had to say to both of those questions. Well. Membership of a community, there's two things. There's a developer community and then there's a user community, right? So user community, I work on the Linux kernel. So anybody who uses the Linux kernel is a member. So the whole world right, is a member of our community. Um, but th that being said, there's a number of people that use the Linux kernel in to make it's a it's a hammer to make other products, right? We're just a tool to do that. So those I would consider our user community that is highly technical, that that interacts with us in a way that um we see more than anybody right they run their workloads they integrate it into a product they do things like that so that would be like our community of users and members of that and that's anybody who uses it in that and then developer community is just anybody who sends us a change i mean that's as simple as that it's really what we have five four between four and five thousand people last year um that did that over 500 companies so those are all members of our community um and then there's you have more um what do i say ownership in that community when you're maintaining a certain part of the project right so we have over seven maybe 800 different people that are documented to be a maintainer of a specific part of the linux kernel and that's they are definitely members of that so 
but membership is basically anybody who uses our stuff. It's not a fixed word that you don't have to pass some litmus test or sign anything or agree to anything. It's very easy. So that's the the who. Um, how about the what? If you remember, what what does that mean? What what rights and responsibilities do you have if you are in one of those three categories? The you all have the same rights and responsibilities as anybody else. You have the right to change the code to do whatever you want to do with it. Any changes that you use and ship and something you must make public by virtue of our license, which is GPL version two. That's it. I mean, that's the only real rights or responsibilities that you have. Nobody can tell anybody to do anything else, right? When you're a maintainer of a project, um, you have an implicit right to basically say, I will fix this stuff, right, if there's a problem. But you're, nobody's holding anybody to it. And the whole goal and the whole joy of this being all open and why it succeeds is because anybody can fix it. Anybody can maintain it. Anybody can update it. Um, so there's no real right, responsibility other than that. I mean, we don't owe anybody anything. and trying to get other people to do work for you is impossible because you can't because nobody works for anybody right so like we try and manage five thousand developers in a year and tell them what to do that that doesn't work that's not how open source projects work you can't tell anybody to do because everybody contributes in a selfish way right everybody contributes to solve the problem that they have which is great because everybody has the same problems in the end so it all works out by virtue of being selfish everybody works out together yeah, that's that's really interesting because you know um, you very much simplified and broken down what a lot of people spend time you know trying to figure out you know because other communities aren't quite as um, focused on the the utilitarianism of just contributing. Um, why shouldn't they? Why aren't? Why not? Why are they doing? I mean, <laughs> that's all you really need, and that's all that matters, right? There are communities that want to make it easier for users to use their product, right? which is great. And you can spend a lot of time on that. But I mean, reality, you don't have to make things complex or complicated. Keep it simple. And that way you can actually grow easier. All right. So Greg is at the end of the spectrum that says, if you show up and do stuff, you're a member. And uh, I, I particularly like that approach. Um, and it also helps to have somebody as prominent and respected as Greg saying, y'all are welcome. Everyone is welcome to come and be part of the party. And uh, so that, you know, I'm just alluding back to what I mentioned earlier. It's important to have this welcoming experience when you show up. Um, and that, uh, I, I think that he embodies that in his answer. Yeah, and, and although it, it is, Almost this really, and I'm not criticizing at all, but compared to other projects that we've talked to, this is a very stark and minimalist way of doing it. And, and again, not a criticism. Um, I, I think it is probably a benefit to something as important as a Linux kernel project that they don't have a lot of bureaucratic overhead uh, as far as membership and citizenship. Um, but it, it's really funny because during our entire conversation with Greg, I kind of got the impression that he was sort of like, why are you guys even asking me about this? Like, not that he was being dismissive or rude in any way, shape or form, but it was like, it's so easy for him. It, yeah, it just, and he, it's just like, boom, boom, boom. What are you guys talking about? And he does, he does a number of times during the interview say things that amount to why do people want to make this more complicated than it needs mm -hmm. to be? So yeah, well, and and it, it's 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 a great question because you know I came away from that interview thinking, yeah, why why do people <laughs> make this more complicated? You know, to the point that I was like, why are we doing podcasts about this particular <laughs> topic? But in seriousness, though. Um, it is, it is interesting though, like you talk about welcoming, um, within the Linux com uh, community and it, it, it's not really there. Uh, and he says this in other parts of the interview, it's, it's, it's implicit, not explicit, um, that, you know, no, you're never going to get a little email or, uh, you know, sure. anything that says, Ooh, welcome to the Linux kernel community. Basically you just... Your patch gets accepted. 
or your any other form of contribution gets in and you're in there's no there's no ceremony or anything like that um so i think in this case that's where dave's um you know point about being you know self-deterministic and accepting yourself as a member of a community really comes into play because nobody from the linux kernel is going to give you a certificate or anything that says hey right. okay, here you go um one of the things that, that Greg mentions that Dave also mentions is this this uh, this gradient was the word that Dave used, kind of a, a continuum from people that use Linux as a as a hammer to solve their problems, people that actually actively engage with the community as users, and then there's there's a jump from there to the developers where they're where they're contributing code, and uh, so you know there's there's this notion that anyone can be a member if they choose to be, but there's also a continuum where you become more integral to the community rather than just being a first time contributor. And so that's that's something that we see across all these interviews is the gradation as you take more and more ownership for the project. Yeah, exactly. And 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 of, of the projects that we've taught to so far and, you know, I, I think historically it's well known that the Linux kernel is very much designed to be a meritocracy. Um, the more you contribute, the more trust you get, and the more chances you, you will become a maintainer of some module or branch or whatever. Um, you know, so that, that does lend itself to that gradation, as you just said. Um, but yeah, really minimalist approach. And and we'll Spoiler alert! This is going to keep coming up when we when we ask Greg different questions, um, but it's valuable and it's a really interesting perspective. Um, and I am, you know, I'm in no way making fun of it at all. I really think <laughs> it's a solid place to be. Another thing that Greg mentions that that caught my attention listening through this again was his statement, and he makes this statement a number of times in the interview that everyone con contributes in a selfish way. Everyone mm -hmm. contributes to solve their own problems. And, uh, it, you know, this is, it's it's an interesting idea around open source because in the early days of open source, people were reluctant to contribute because they're giving away something. Mm -hmm. And and here's this notion that I am giving something away purely to benefit myself. So I don't have to maintain it long-term. So I don't have to fix the bugs in it later. You know, there's a lot of reasons why selfishness, as Larry Wall says, is one of the one of the attributes of a of a programmer. I contribute to this project for selfish reasons, and I've I've always found that to be just a fascinating paradox that that uh, embodies what open source is about. Yeah, well, and to me, I'd never heard it quite expressed like that. I've never heard Larry Wall say that, and and this is the first time I heard Greg say that. And it really resonated with me back in the days when I was a reporter and there was this constant debate about like everybody was scratching their own itch mm -hmm. when they yeah, would start a new open source project. And, and that is tangentially related to the same thing. Now, maybe they should have come back to the larger project that was already there, but that's another debate for another time. But yeah, that definitely resonated with me as well. And I love the way... Like that was one of those aha moments. Like, mm -hmm. oh, that is that is brilliant. I can put down my comic books. Our third and final guest is Jack Abutbul. And Jack is kind of my counterpart at the Alma Linux project. So I'm the community manager for CentOS Linux. Jack is the community manager for the Alma Linux project. And our two projects are friendly rivals in the space of Linux distributions. Uh, we invited Jack because he recently instituted a formal membership ar arrangement, a formal membership program around the Alma Linux project to identify who's who's a member. So we we wanted to talk to Jack about what that means and you know any questions that we're asking our other guests. Yeah, so we launched our membership program. Uh, I guess it's a couple of months ago now, um, and that was our intention really from the outset. Uh, of the project. It was just 
Uh, it took time to get all of the um, infrastructure for, it, let's say, uh, off the ground. And I, I don't mean technical structure, technical infrastructure. I mean legal mm -hmm. infrastructure. Um, and what it means to us is uh, basically, if you're a member, um, since we are a nonprofit, so you can think of, of it as the analog of being a shareholder and a for-profit company. So for us, a member is a shareholder of the nonprofit, even though technically there is no such thing. But um, uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, a shareholder, uh, uh, sorry, a member of the nonprofit is basically one of the owners of the nonprofit, right? So um, it, because the, the nonprofit is there to serve its membership. So if you're, if you're a member, then the nonprofit is there to serve you. Um, and what that also meant for us is that we wanted to make sure that there was no, let's say, uh, central uh, control or ownership of all of the assets of the project. And so we felt the best way to accomplish that was to have everyone sign up to be a member. And then this way, uh, all the members are then collectively responsible so it's it's a it's a, a communal ownership model, uh, if you, if you want to put it that way. And then this way, uh, all the members are now owners of that property and are stewards of that property, and they get to vote and decide, you know, which direction things should take. And uh, for us, it was just important because I, I there are a lot of great pro open source projects uh, uh, out there. And uh, I feel that the, like this communal ownership model is something that is very missing, um, especially from some of the larger projects, which are, which are you know, founded and funded by large companies. Uh, I, I think that the companies, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, they own the intellectual property. And we wanted this to be something that the community owned. Uh, and that was very important to us. What can a member do that? somebody who just happens to be on your mailing list cannot do? Uh, you get to vote. So if there was, uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, let's say our upstream made a change, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a change that was fundamentally incompatible with uh, what the stated purpose of our project was. What do we do when we get to those crossroads? Um, and I think at that point, it would be up to the membership to decide, you know, hey, we, we, we can't continue in the direction that we were continuing because of X. And so, therefore, we should do this other thing because that is what serves us best. I, I think I missed part of the earlier answer. Who gets to be a member? How does that get decided? Ah, so um, uh, basically... We're looking for, uh, you know, some activity in the project. So you don't need to be actively contributing code because not all, not all participants in a project will be contributing code. It's just, yes. Yeah, so plus. basically not, not, all, not all contributions are code. Not all contributors are going to contribute code. And so basically we're looking just in general for people that are active within the project, you know. Um, and that could be someone that helps promote us on social media, let's say, you know, uh, someone that uh, uh, wrote a blog post about something, someone that's active in the chat, someone that has a mirror. Um, any of those qualify someone to become a member. And so uh, it's really open to anyone that shows any sort of uh, activity within the project and then uh, what we did is we selected a membership committee of three people. Uh, one of them is on the board. Uh, two of them are not. They're just really active contributors. And they kind of know, you know, I mean, we, we all kind of know everybody that's active in the day to day. And if they mm -hmm. don't know, they can, you know, they can turn to me or they could turn to anyone else and, and just ask them, you know, what's this person's involvement? And so, uh, and, they, and they ultimately vote on that person uh, and whether they get membership. So I, there are, thankfully, the people that applied so far have been people that have been 
uh, quite active. Uh, uh, so we really haven't rejected uh, too many people. I know there were some people that we kind of asked them. We didn't outright reject them, but we just asked them to become a little bit more active. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and that's a good way to kind of, uh, figure out how to get them involved with the project too, because we already see that they have a will to get involved. It's just kind of directing their energy somewhere. And so, uh, it's been, it's been good so far. And, uh, we've seen everybody that has applied and that has been accepted, um, has been active in one way or another. So, um, it's, it's a good gauge of the health of the community. And uh, I think that we 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 did well there uh, by setting it up that way. So, Jack is uh, their take for all Linux is very much. Um, it's almost like an IP approach to um, community membership, and I I I'll I'll be honest because you know we're trying to be, but it's it's sort of like. Uh, putting on my red hat hat that this almost feels a little bit reactionary to the idea that the community owns the copyright, the community owns the IP, and therefore it will be safe in the community's hands. Yeah. And this is, I think, a reaction for right or wrong to some of the things that have been going on around CentOS. Um, and and but that doesn't necessarily make it wrong. And this is the first time I've heard somebody like describe community membership as sort of like a shareholder type pact. I think it is fair to say that that it is a reaction to that. I mean, in the early in the early days of the Alma project when they were setting up the 501c6, uh, is it a C6 or a C3? Anyway, when they were setting up the nonprofit, one of the stated concerns was not allowing a single corporation to be the sole owner of of anything in the project like is the case with Red Hat and CentOS. So so I think that that is a fair statement to make. Another thing that struck me is that here's a project where the project and the foundation are one and the same thing as compared to Linux where Linux is part of the Linux foundation. And so mm -hmm. there's a, a separation there. And so many of these same things are happening. They're just not happening at the project level. And uh, so it's it, it's when when a, a project and a foundation are conflated like that, it can it can cause some some com, some necessary complexity that uh, that we see in in Jack's answer here. Right, right. Um, and, and, and the other thing that's different about this too is, and again, not a criticism, Alma Linux is a new community. It's, it's not been around very long and they, we can see a snapshot of where they are at the very beginning of their community. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they've been around less than a year. Um, and, and so they're, they're kind of, they're able to kind of stand on the shoulders of, of giants, so to speak and pick and choose from different ideas from different communities. Um, and, and yeah, um, I kind of like their approach a little bit. Um, I, I know I just said that, you know, Greg, you know, Greg describing the minimalist approach in, of the kernel um, it is, you know, appealing and it certainly is, but this notion of communal ownership um, certainly appeals to the, you know, my inner communist. <laughs> and, and 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 getting that that done um it'll be interesting to see how they kind of pull this off um because i do like any other thing in the linux community and this in this particular distro community i wish them well um but yeah I, i'm hoping that they don't trip themselves up on the on the bureaucracy because yeah after talking to greg it's like what are you, what are you doing it's also worth noting anecdotally that my understanding is that people that have applied for membership have been accepted for membership like almost unanimously except in a few cases of spam and mm -hmm. I, you know i don't speak for the project and so that might not be 100 percent accurate but that's been my impression based on conversations on irc right Right, and and so it's it's kind of a pro forma, and well, and as Jack said, 
they have gone back to some people and say, hey, maybe you want to contribute something um, and, and, and get that in. And, and so you don't get people just knocking on the door saying, yeah. oh, I want to be a member, send me a sticker or something. They are being a bit proactive and coming back and saying, hey, can we actually uh, produce something? Uh, and, and send it our way. And I think that's a reasonable uh, request. Back in the days when, you know, in, in the olden days when people used uh, things other than Git for uh, source control, an aspect of membership was the, the holy commit right, the ability to commit directly to the repository. And there too, I say, we, we used to see a, a, a big, uh, continuum between projects that would give you the commit right if you showed up and asked, and ones that would require a certain number of accepted patches. Um, when I was community manager at SourceForge, there was a project that had as policy to give commit rights to anybody that showed up on the mailing list or asked for it. And one of the things, I can't remember the name of the project, I need to go back and look. But one of the things that that I found fascinating about them is that they had never had somebody abuse that and mm -hmm. that, you know, we have source control so that if something is committed that shouldn't be there, we can revert it. And, and that was their that was their attitude. If if somebody does happen to abuse this right, um, we can we can remove the patch. No harm. And uh, so, you know, within. When I've, when I've mentored communities that set that barrier to entry too high, one of the things that I've asked them to consider is what risk they are trying to protect from. Mm -hmm. Because the risk of giving committer rights too soon is that somebody will commit something that you then have to revert. No harm done. The risk of not giving them commit rights soon enough is that they're going to get annoyed and leave and you've lost a potential contributor and so that to me that's always been the balance that i've that i've tried to encourage projects to consider when when figuring out where this barrier to entry is for for membership exactly exactly yeah and i and i'm a big believer in the lower the barrier to entry the you know the better it is i mean yes there are security things uh, that should be in place um, obviously um, and just good general coding practices. Uh, but yeah, um, I think lower barriers to entry are, are better. It's interesting, you know, that I've heard, you know, your source for story. I've heard other stories about similar projects that, you know, basically just let it go. And, and very rarely do you hear like bad, like horror stories about that. And I think that's probably uh diagnostic you know that that that's something you should kind of take note of that yeah just revert it if something really goes bad um and definitely pay attention to your releases but you know uh, yeah. so what are our so, conclusions here oh that there's no real <laughs> that there's no real answer to the question of what is membership yeah. um as far but I and do, it's clear I, that we have some opinions though, right? So <laughs> right. So because you know, why else would we be we be yakking? But uh, I I do get the sense. So there was one common thread through all of them. And 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 Dave and Jack and, and Greg were all basically saying at some point, so contribution was certainly a key common thread, yeah. um, at least in open source projects. And we aren't talking about any kind of uh, membership right now. Um, in later episodes, we, we're going to dive a little bit into the meta concept of, of citizenship with a couple of our guests. But right now, we're just talking about open source projects. Um, contribution was certainly a common thread. But beyond that, I'm not sure I can think of any. Um, I think it really kind of came down to that. And yeah, I think so. Contribution and and sort of taking a personal ownership of of the community. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, well, yeah, because you certainly had to do it in the Linux kernel, and I think even in the Alma Linux um, situation, you had to yeah. um, take that. They were just a little bit more formal about it and saying, "Okay, here's what you need to do, um, and here's what you get out of it." 
and they were a bit more declarative. I guess that's a better word than formal. So, yeah. So that is what it takes. And I guess if you think about it in a broader term, that's kind of what it means to be a citizen of anything. I mean, if I move from one state to another, I'm being pretty intentional about it. Um, you know, and here I am, and now I'm going to participate in this wacky society that I find myself in. So as we continue this conversation, we're going to be talking about other aspects of citizenship, one of which is how communities are managed, led, governed, whatever word is appropriate to the particular community. And so that's what we'll be delving into in our next episode. So until then, um, my name is Brian Proffitt. And I'm Rich Bowen. And we welcome you to come join us again on another edition of The Open Road.